2 p.m. Eastern, here on C-SPAN 3's American History TV. University of Texas at Dallas professor Natalie Ring talks about the common practice of lynching black men as punishment for perceived crimes in the Jim Crow era South. She describes how socially active African-American women, such as Ida B. Wells, challenged the view of black men as predatory towards white women, a factor that often played a role in lynching. Her class is about an hour and ten minutes. So, in the past few lectures, we've been looking at the Jim Crow justice system. We've talked a little bit about convict leasing. Um, Last Wednesday, we looked at the practices and um, kind of patterns of lynching. We talked a little bit about how white Southerners, in particular politicians, are using gendered rhetoric. We talked a little bit about the white um, ideas about sexuality and race were used to create political support uh, among white men. Uh, what else have we looked at? We've talked extensively about the myth of the black beast rapist and how that revolved around the idea that white women were passive and virtuous and kind of outside of um, the male-dominated political sphere. The supposed rape of white women was also seen as an assault on white male honor. We sat through all of Birth of a Nation, and um, that includes that classic trope, right? We looked at the mythology of Reconstruction, the way in which the Ku Klux Klan is celebrated at the end. There's the scene where the white daughter of the Southern family is stalked by Gus, the former Union soldier and black criminal, and she throws herself off the cliff rather than be raped. The Klan comes to the rescue. Um, and that particular movie we were looking at uh, uh, that particular movie is an example of that trope, that all black men want to rape um, white women. But today what I'd like to talk about is the way in which women themselves participated in that particular uh, dialogue. So some people want to know what did southern white women have, if anything, to say about lynching, particularly in the 1890s when it was kind of at its height. Uh, how did black women um, begin to critique the systematic violence that was perpetrated against their brothers, their husbands, their fathers, and their friends. And so in this particular lecture, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, comparing a woman named Rebecca Latimer Felton with Ida B. Wells. But most of the lecture, I think, will largely be um, on uh, Ida B. Wells. So um, let me just give you a little bit of reminder about what we examined when it came to lynching. Um, between 1890 and 1917, two or, th or three black Southerners were lynched per week, whether they were burned or mutilated or shot or tortured or hung. We examined how those lynchings are very ritualistic and they follow certain patterns. We looked at the spectacle nature of lynchings and how they became a very distinctive Southern phenomenon. We, what else did we look at? We looked at the entire cottage industry of photographs that were sold as souvenirs, the way in which some of these lynching photographs were made into postcards. People were posing in the pictures. Yes, people were um, posing in the pictures. And I remember that was one of the things that was really kind of startling to you guys, and that you look in these photograph in, photographs and you see that there's absolutely no shame. There's no effort on the part of people to hide their faces because, in a sense, there isn't a need to do that because you, you have a situation in which extra-legal violence, the lynching of African Americans, is, is literally a sanctioned community affair. Lynchings were so common during this period that you know, uh, Mark Twain once um, called the country the United States of lyncherdom. Remember, we also looked at how spectacle lynchings involved a form of entertainment for, for white Southerners, and if they weren't the result of spontaneous mob violence, then you might see advertisements in newspapers that invited people to watch, and the crowds got very, very large. This image here up on the screen is a cartoon that appeared in 1934 in The New Yorker, and it was drawn by a cartoonist named Reginald March, and what it does is capture, I think, really well the function of the crowd at a spectacle lynching. And it, you can see from 
the crowd here, and you can even see from the caption that the crowd includes white women and it includes children. The cartoon represents a kind of a country lynch mob that's in front of a farmhouse. They're watching this lynching. They're watching the fire kind of burn out of range. You don't see the lynching per se, but it really is designed to draw you to the crowd, and you see the mother holding up the child, and the quote reads, "This is her." First lynching, and what the cartoonist I think is implying is that lynching was both a communal entertainment, but it also involved the participation of women and children. And in this particular cartoon, they're very、um, visual; they're very obvious.、Um, these are clips from photographs, and I think we did look at.、Um, I think the photograph that we looked at was the lynching of Reuben Stacy. I'm not sure if we actually did the lynchings of Thomas Ship and Abram. Yeah, we did. Thomas. Oh, we did do those. Okay. Yeah, because one of the things I remember is how you you guys were looking at this and you were sort of saying, "Wow, the crowd、um, contains white women, contains、um, children," and we can see that they were very, very active participants in the mobs. They came to witness the spectacle. They were there with family and friends. And what do you notice about those? Particular pictures. They're smiling.、Yeah. They're smiling. I don't know what it's showing. It just looks like it's an everyday thing. Yeah, it's it sort of looks like it's an every everyday thing.、Mm-hmm. No one has any sense of remorse on their face. They're looking directly at the camera, so there's really、like、no attempt to hide their identity. They're looking directly at the camera. There's no attempt to hide their identity. What about what they're wearing? Oh, they're yeah. formal. Yeah, yeah, it kind of has a formal,、uh, kind of like it's a formal look to it. Like, they're dressed yeah, up. Watch this lynching, and then we're all gonna. It's go like to dance it's like going to church almost. I don't know if it's any kind of a real point, but it doesn't show the face of the lynching of the guy being lynched. I actually cut that off、oh, okay. because I wanted you to focus more explicitly on the faces of the crowd. Rather than the individual individuals that were lynched,、um, so those are purposely cut off just to kind of highlight and isolate、um, the crowd. But if you have white women that are participating in these lynchings, in a sense, what they're doing is validating the righteousness of the cause. Especially if the lynching involved an accusation of、um, the rape of a white woman by、um, a black man, and then you would get anti-lynching advocates. That would point to the presence of women and children in the crowd as evidence of their utter moral depravity. So the existence of white women at, lynch- at lynchings was not unusual.、Um, it wouldn't be unusual necessarily to see children, particularly if these were big spectacle lynchings that had been advertised、um, early on. And、um, The other way that white women might participate is not even necessarily be at the crowd, but if the accusation of the crime involved the alleged or rape of a white woman by a black man, sometimes the crowd or the authorities would go to the white woman and ask her to、um, verbally make the identification and the accusation herself. Because sometimes she might serve as the only witness. So studies of lynching in general、uh, haven't focused very much on white Southern women and their responses to rape, particularly early on in the 1880s, 1890s, and 1910s. When we get into the 19-teens and 1920s. We start to see a more vigorous and kind of vibrant anti-lynching movement that does involve white women. And there's a woman named Jessie Daniel Ames from Texas who became、um, an anti-lynching crusader in her own right. We don't have time to talk about her today. We're going to be looking at her、um, a little bit on Wednesday when we focus more explicitly on Texas and you know what was going on in in, in Waco and、um, elsewhere. But this was one white woman that was particularly vocal about lynchings and about this issue. She was a woman named Rebecca Latimer Felton, born in Georgia in 1835 to a very prosperous slaveholding family. She 
met her husband, William Felton, when she was 17 years old. She was actually the valedictorian of her high school class, and she was giving a speech. Her husband was a 30-year-old uh, man in the area who had been married previously but was widowed, had, his, had a daughter, uh, was giving a speech at the high school graduation as well, and in a, in a way, I guess that's really kind of how they, how they kind of met. So she ends up marrying William Felton, uh, moves to his farm. He was a pretty well-known political figure in his own right. He was an independent Democrat. He ran for the 7th Congressional District seat from Georgia, and Rebecca Latimer Felton served as his campaign manager. And so in a sense, she very, very early on was entering the political arena. She was a super sharp woman. Uh, she wrote many of his speeches. She helped draft some of the bills. Um, sometimes constituents actually brag that they were getting two representatives for the price of one. But she was very, very aggressive and very, very assertive. And she ended up campaigning for prohibition. She became a member of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. She ended up campaigning against convict leasing. She was an advocate for women's suffrage. And she was particularly concerned about poor white women. And she was interested in improving education for poor white women. But one of the things that Rebecca Latimer Felton is known for is her concern that there were a lot of white women on farms, that farms and plantations, that were essentially isolated. And she felt like they didn't quite have the proper protection from their husbands. And this is something I think that she, in a way, remembers uh, as a child um, growing up in, in the rural, rural South. And in a sense, she had this extremely radical view of female protection. She thought that white women should actually be demanding protection from white men. Um, there were instances in which she actually made the argument that the state government should provide the things that white men could not Provide. She's best known, the reason I'm, I wanted to bring up Rebecca Latimer Felton is she's best known for speech that she gave in 1897 called Women on the Farm. And she said that white women worked extremely hard, particularly women that were on farms and um, on plantations. She was very, very much concerned with lower class white women, women that were the um, wives, the sisters, the daughters of yeoman farmers. And she said these were the kind of women that got up really early at dawn. They worked until sunset. They were working sometimes in the fields. They had their children alongside with them. They also were responsible for raising their children. And she said, these are the kinds of women that are receiving absolutely nothing themselves. And their husbands would leave them at home. They were isolated. Their husbands would go to town. They would go out and fraternize with their friends. And so one of the things that was really pretty radical about um, Rebecca Latimer Felton is that in this particular speech, Woman on the Farm, she made the analogy that these white women who were isolated on these farms were in a perpetual state of bondage. And it was a kind of curious analogy to make because she was saying in some ways that they were very much like slaves. But pre precisely because these white women actually weren't slaves, it was a useful kind of rhetoric that she could use to um, kind of shame men into more equitable treatment. And to shame them into feeling guilty for not providing perfection, excuse me, protection. And um, she said that these white women were um, isolated on farms, and there they were, therefore they were in danger of being raped by black men. So Rebecca Latimer Felton was known for particularly relying on that trope of black men raping white women. Um, she felt that this was something that had gotten out of control after the Civil War that black men no longer had, quote, a proper place on the plantation. She very much believed in that notion of the black man as, as, a, as a beast, as a rapist. She was also upset about the fact that black men had been given the right to vote during Reconstruction. And remember, we talked a little bit about the ways in which um, anxieties about black men having the right to vote politically kind of sometimes morphed into anxieties about social equality. And people began to presume that perhaps if black men were given political rights, they would soon want to be married to white women. They would 
perhaps even be led to rape white women. It kind of shows up a little bit in the film Birth of a Nation when you see that sign um, at the Republican political rally. Remember, equal rights, equal politics, equal uh, marriage. So um, Rebecca Latimer Felton is one of these women that was pretty pretty vocal about about this particular um, problem of black men posing a threat to white women. And she's, in a way, leveling a pretty implicit criticism at white men and saying, in some ways, that it's their duty to make sure that women have the protection that they should have. But now I want to turn to Ida B. Wells, um, in particular because you got to read Southern Horrors today, and I want to focus a little bit more explicitly on her because... She was another woman that was very forthright, very vocal, um, began to speak out publicly about lynching, although she certainly had different sorts of things to say than Rebecca Latimer Felton. And she's one of the most recognized women at the turn of the century that fought racial injustices in the South. Um, what else can I tell you about Rebecca Latimer Felton? Um, in some ways... It's, excuse me, uh, Ida B. Wells. Um, in some ways, the reason I, I did that is because in some ways, it's so, it's so interesting because Rebecca Latimer Feld and Ida B. Wells were these women that were known to be very opinionated and known to be very public and very loud about um, what they thought. And in fact, there was a black newspaper editor named T. Thomas Fortune who had this to say about Wells. He basically said if Wells were a man, she would be a humming independent in politics, and she had plenty of nerve, and she was sharp as a steel trap. And I think that was really quite true. And you got to read Southern Horrors, and I think you get a sense of her um, in, indignant uh, commentary about this issue of lynching. And we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. Ida B. Wells also was born a slave, in 1862 in Holly Springs, Mississippi. She came of age during Reconstruction. Um, we spent the first part of this class looking at what happened during Reconstruction, how this was a moment of possibility of interracial democracy, particularly after Republicans passed the Military Reconstruction Act in 1867. And remember, we looked at how they began to divide the South into military districts. They appointed congressionally appointed governors. We get the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments. We get the formation of the Freedmen's Bureau. There's a significant amount of grassroots mobilization among African Americans. And when the military registered the freedmen, remember, they came um, in large numbers to vote. They established new organizations. They presented new demands. They helped draft state constitutions. And the reason I'm sort of reminding you about this moment during Reconstruction is that Ida B. Wells' parents um, were slaves as well. They're all emancipated at the end of the war, and this was a family that got very involved in Republican politics and took advantage of the Freedmen's Bureau and what it had to offer. And, um, for example, her father was um, part of this, this group called the Loyal League. And this was an organization that was designed to protect black voting rights. Um, her parents were very, very strong role models. They worked hard. They held places of respect in the community. Um, the other interesting thing is that they really tried to inculcate a sense of independence in their children. As I said, they sent their children to Freedmen's Bureau schools. And actually, um, Ida B. Wells' mother um, showed up at the school with her um, in Holly Springs, Mississippi. It was one of the first Freedmen's Bureau schools. And the both of them went to the school so they could learn together. Her parents had eight children. When Ida B. Wells was 16 years old, her parents and her younger brother died of a yellow fever epidemic. This was a really, really bad strain of yellow fever in 1878. Sometimes what would happen in the South when you had these strains of yellow fever or malaria or typhoid, oftentimes people would leave the rural areas and they would flee to cities particularly because the city was seen as, as a kind of a safer place. The other concern was if you were to stay put, you'd be surrounded by all of these people 
who are becoming ill, and there was a possibility that you yourself will become ill as well. And so 2,000 people left um, the Holly Springs, Mississippi area, but her parents stayed. Uh, and unfortunately, both her parents and uh, her brother died, caught yellow fever and um, died in the epidemic. And there was Ida B. Wells, who was 16 years old, with five siblings. And so she assumed responsibility for taking care of her siblings. But Ida B. Wells was, was a pretty remarkable woman. I mean, she grew up in this um, moment in which the prom- there were the promises of politics for African Americans. And remember, Mississippi was one of these places where there was a, a, a kind of moment in which it seemed possible. Remember, Mississippi is the state that had two black U.S. senators, um, Blanche Bruce and and Hiram Revels. Now, we know that Reconstruction ends, that that last gasp for interracial democracy is essentially wiped out. And that's really what this course is about, right, is how how, how that that moment ended and the building blocks that were put in place for Jim Crow, but for her coming of age during Reconstruction, attending the Freedmen School, um, seeing her father actively involved in, in politics, I think she had a sense of the possibilities for African Americans, and this really greatly influenced her. She began her career as a teacher, but she ended up in Memphis, which at the time was about 40 miles from Holly Springs, where she grew up. She wrote a weekly column under a pen name, Iola, uh, as a journalist, she was very blunt. She did not mince words. She was kind of known for stating her case kind of simply and directly. And the other pretty remarkable thing about Ida B. Wells is that um, in 1889, she purchased one-third of uh, a business interest in a newspa- newspaper called the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight. And she's the first black woman owner and editor of of a black newspaper in the United States. Later, she became an editor for the Memphis Evening Star. She wrote for a lot of other newspapers and magazines um, and became a leading community activist. The other thing that you should know about Ida B. Wells, and we're going to be looking at this in a couple of weeks when we sort of begin to turn our attention more specifically to the ways in which African Americans both middle class and working class began to push back and resist um, Jim Crow in the South. But Ida B. Wells was one of these women, these black women, um, that we see starting to protest segregated streetcars, starting to kind of agitate um, against that. When she was 20 years old, she got onto the Chesapeake, Ohio and Southwestern Railroad. She had bought a first class ticket We had talked about how streetcars and trains were kind of the lightning rod for segregation, where all of this kind of came to the forefront. And the railroad refused to let her sit in the first-class car. The first-class car sometimes was referred to as the ladies' car. So in the Victorian era, if women were traveling alone, and this was something that Ida B. Wells did regularly, if you were um, a woman in this era and you were traveling alone, there was a possibility that you might be bothered by or um, harassed by men. And so the first class car sometimes came to be known as the ladies' car. So if you bought a first class ticket, you would go into the ladies' car. The smoker car was the car that was really a more of a male space. And I think I talked to you about how that was the car that wasn't necessarily the place for women. Um, you would see men of all classes there. The only time you might see a man on a lady's car, if he was a spouse, he was kind of um, traveling with a woman. But early on, the streetcars were sort of segregated by gender, and over time they become segregated by race. But Ida B. Wells bought the first-class ticket, gets on, tries to get on the first-class car, and the conductor asks her to move to the smoking car. And she refuses. And she was a very, very tiny woman. She was only about five feet tall. But she was very opinionated. She was very persistent. Um, And she actually was literally physically and forcibly removed from the car. So the conductor tried 
to get her, tried to pull her out of the seat. She bit his hand. Um, she was like literally hanging on. He brought two other men in. Um, she was putting up a pretty impressive fight. She's literally hanging on, and the conductor plus these two men were sort of able to like tear her out of her seat. And basically, rather than go to the smoker car, she decides to get off the train. She believed this was a complete infringement of her rights and an insult to her personhood. She sued the railroad. Um, the state judge actually ruled in her favor because he said there was an 1881 state law that required the railroad company to furnish white and black passengers with separate but equal first class cars. They gave her an award of $200. Um, a year later, she was refused entry again, bought a first class ticket, couldn't get into the first class car. She sued a second time, was given an award of $500, but the railroad appealed all the way to the Tennessee Supreme Court and the decision was essentially um, overturned. But I think these instances in which she is refusing to get into the smoker car, she's insisting that she bought um, the ticket, the way in which she begins to write as an editorialist, she was very, very incensed about the institution of, of Jim Crow laws. She witnessed inequities in the school system. She was infuriated when she saw that African Americans had little or absolutely no protection against violence. But she's best known for her anti-lynching campaign. And that's really what I want to focus on today. And we'll spend some time um, looking at what she um, had to say in Southern, um, uh, Southern Horrors. Um, remember, Lynching was um, particularly bad in uh, the 1890s. Just in 1892, there were 241 lynchings across 26 states. We talked a little bit about how some of those lynchings included Native Americans, Asians, uh, Chicanos, or Mexican Americans, and whites, but the bulk were African Americans. And we see how over time, um, lynching becomes much more of a southern distinctive phenomenon and it becomes much more of a phenomenon that involves black men as um, victims. Ida B. Wells uh, became an advocate, an anti-lynching advocate. She's known for penning um, a couple of pamphlets. You read Southern Horrors Lynch Law in all its phases. She also wrote Lynch Law in Georgia. She was repeatedly writing columns in her newspapers. And I'll have to tell you that even, or at least early on, um, Ida B. Wells' understanding of lynching might strike you as a little bit conventional. And there was an event that really kind of caused her to shift her mind in terms of what she thought about why lynching was happening and the way in which the South was explaining this. Um, early on, if you had asked Ida B. Wells, um, not, do you think lynching is, is, is a, okay as a form of retribution, but if you asked Ida B. Wells whether or not she thought black men had raped white women or if that was a kind of common occurrence, she might likely have agreed that that was a problem. And, um that perhaps um, you know, a fair amount of lynchings did, did involve that. But there was something that happened to her that really kind of changed her opinion about lynchings, and this involved three um, uh, friends of hers. I don't know if you got a sense of it. I'm not sure she talks necessarily too explicitly about it in Southern Horrors. But she had three male friends who owned a black grocery store. It was called People's Grocery Store. And this happened to be a grocery store that was in a neighborhood known as The Curve. It was a predominantly black neighborhood, but there were actually two grocery stores in the neighborhood. One was the People's Grocery owned by these three black men, and one was a grocery store owned by a white man. And in March of 1892, there were a group of boys, white and black boys, that were playing marbles together. They were kind of hanging out by the two rival grocery stores, and a fight broke out. Um, wouldn't be uncommon, right? You see kids playing. Sometimes, you know, they get into spats with each other. But this was an interracial group of children that were playing marbles. Mm -hmm. And they kind of got into a little bit of a fight. And the father of one of the white players shows up. And he ends up 
whipping a black child named Armor Harris. And Armor had actually won the marbles. And maybe that was one of the things that had kind of started、um, the fight among these kids. And so one of the white children's father shows up, ends up whipping Armor.、Um, some other adults arrive. Armor's father comes. Some friends come. And they basically get kind of like dragged into this fray. And a group of white men, including the owner of the white grocery store, start to fight with、um, Armour's father and his friend. So, what we have is, is kind of a, a, a moment in which these children are playing marbles.、Um, it kind of, they get into a fight, it kind of escalates. But this is the Jim Crow South, right? And this is a, it's a moment where it could kind of touch off, it could become something bigger, and the parents eventually sort of get involved. And it really inflamed racial tensions in the community because the owner of the white grocery store winds up persuading a grand jury to invite, sorry, excuse me, to indict the people's grocery store for creating a public nuisance.、Um, a rumor starts to spread that there's a white mob that's going to attack the people's grocery store. Ida B. Wells' three friends who own the grocery store、uh, are anticipating this attack. They ask for help from the police. The police decline. So these men decide they're going to station guards around the grocery store. These three black men are going to station their own guards around the grocery store. What winds up happening is the white grocery store owner brings nine deputies with him.、Um, he's driven away by The men, the black men that are sort of there to kind of protect their own property and protect their own turf. They start firing on the group of deputies. It's not clear. We think they likely didn't even know what was, they, they weren't sure, they didn't know that this was a group of deputies because there was a rumor circulating that a mob was going to show up. The deputies regroup, they come back, they arrest 12 black men, including the three men that own the people's grocery store. And over several days, the Memphis police come back. They arrest more black men at random. We start to see、um, racial tensions getting even, even more intense. The story gets reported in the newspaper. It's totally blown out of proportion. And suddenly, the people's grocery store kind of becomes the center of, of、um, this, 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 racial ten-、uh, this racial tension.、Um, What winds up happening is that her three friends who own the people's grocery store are in prison, and a white mob shows up at the prison, seizes them from the prison, brings them out to a field, lines them up, and essentially executes them. And this would be, this would be considered、um, a lynching. And this was the moment, I think, that really caused Ida B. Wells to change her opinion about lynching and what was going on. Because initially, in, as I said, initially early on, she accepted the idea that lynchings might actually be the result of, of rape, or in particular, the result of black men committing other crimes. But with this particular moment, she really kind of realized the truth. And she sort of understood that, that lynching Was not always a punishment for a crime per se,、um, but it really was an act of terror that was perpetrated against a race of people in order to maintain power and control. And clearly, her three friends who owned this grocery store were perceived to be a threat, right? They were upstanding men in the community, they owned their own property. And so her immediate response was to write a series of editorials encouraging African Americans to leave the South. She wrote an editorial responding to her friends. Lynching. It was an editorial that was so incendiary that she was essentially driven out of the South. Her office was ransacked. They burned the building down. She barely gets out with her life. And she starts the anti lynching crusade and she publishes these pamphlets Southern Whores, Lynch Law in All Its Phases. And one of the things that she tries to do in these pamphlets is demonstrate that public assumptions about why black men were lynched. We're absolutely wrong. And she does a, a really pretty amazing job of kind of deconstructing the, the inconsistencies in that particular argument. Because what she starts to begin to tell people is that most of these so called, quote, crimes 
that black men are being lynched for are actually achievements. So her friends are successful merchants who were killed. Or she starts to note that maybe you would be uh, lynched if you were a prosperous farmer. Or if black men decided that they wanted to exercise the right to vote, they might be the target of a lynch mob. She starts to criticize the South, saying that it's attempting to shield itself by claiming that lynchings had everything to do with the honor of white women. But one of the things that Ida B. Wells does when she starts to collect all of this data and these statistics about lynchings and to kind of start to look around and and, and take a broader a broader um, look is is to see to see that um, actually only about a third, or at least in her, what she discovers, that only about a third of the victims had actually been charged with uh, rape. She also makes some pretty provocative arguments about what she thinks is actually going on between black men and um, southern white women, and she tries to kind of invert these assumptions that people had. Now, in the piece of southern horrors that you read, I'm not sure she, in, in this particular section that I gave you, she is as explicit about what she thinks the issue is with white men. She's much more um, uh, clear uh, in chapter one what she thinks about white women and, um, and, and black men as well. But do you remember, can you, can you get a sense from the reading at all what she might have thought about white men or what one of the myths was that she was trying to, to kind of deconstruct. I mean, everything she's saying is so incredibly provocative. I mean, you can see why she's driven out. <laughs> Go ahead. That white men um, were committing the same kind of crimes against black girls. I mean, from that's what I got from this reading. And um, the, actually, the white black men were actually having like relationships with those women, those women who they got, um, it's the claim that they, they got raped or people saying that, that they were raping the women. They actually weren't raping the women, they were involved in relationships. But then a lot of time when they were found out, the women, you know, they just had to say it was rape because they didn't want to be caught. And she was just complaining that the men who, the white men who committed the same kind of crimes against uh, against blacks, they weren't getting punished. They were being freed. They, you know, they they were being protected, while the black men were being hunted and killed for not do what what they were not actually doing. <laughs> okay. So, what would happen to a white woman who was found out uh, in a relationship with a black man? Would she be sentenced to a lynching as well, or? How would that work out? Well, what is, what is, I mean, Ida B. Wells tells several stories in here, right, about white women. And what, what, do you remember the spe- specificity of the stories? The sort of, what actually winds up happening to white women who are found in these relationships that are actually consensual relationships? As you're implying, one of the things that she tries to do is, is sort of point out that some of these white women are having these consensual relationships with black men, and black men are being charged for raping these white women. And the inverse of that, as we as we sort of started with, and we can get back to that, is she's pointing out that white men are are raping black women. Um, that many black women actually were raped as children. And she's saying that even though the South has these anti-miscegenation laws, remember we talked about the anxieties of, re- regarding interracial sex and the way in which you start to see the passage of these anti-miscegenation laws in the early 20th century. And she says, you know, in some ways it's rather hypocritical because these white men are um, either raping black women or even harassing black women perhaps maybe even having a consensual relationship, but regardless, nothing ever, nothing ever comes of that. It's, it's something that people sort of turn a blind eye to. But Bryce, you were asking what would happen to a white woman that was found in 
a relationship, in a relationship with, a black, with a black man. Do you remember what she says about that? Well, there was the, uh, the one woman that had a child with, I think it was a coachman or something like that, and she had a, a child who came out and was like, very dark, and the doctor was like, well, oh, it's a, it's a Negro child. And then that woman, as soon as she was well, she was like forced to leave and like just ran away west, I think. So it would be considered um, like a scandal. So there is the one story of, um, I think that was an, wasn't that a, um, cause she talks about lower white, oh, lower yeah, class white women, but she also talks about an array of white women that are having these consensual, consensual relationships with African American men. Yeah. That was a very well off woman. Yeah. That was a very well off woman. And two children that were both like dark. And the first one they said was like, because of some distant ancestor she had who was like tan or something. And then the second one, the doctor, said it was a Negro child. And then after that, she was forced to leave town. So she was forced to leave town. So you might be, you might have to leave town. Do you remember what else happens to some of these white women? What if you were um, uh, a white woman who uh, wasn't married? What if you were... I think she tells the story of one woman who's 17 years old and gets involved with a black man... Um, And some of them, she um, she was just talking about how one one particular white girl would not reveal who the person was, but not you know that he couldn't do anything to her, and her family tried to protect her. You know, they didn't do anything because she wouldn't reveal the person's name who she was involved with. So there might be an instance in which she wouldn't she she didn't reveal her name. I mean, one of the things that's pretty remarkable about this document is that she is taking reports from white newspapers, not black newspapers, but white newspapers, which kind of gives her a certain credibility in the accusations, at least should give credibility in the, eye, in the sort of minds and eyes of white people. And she walks you through these different examples and stories in which this happens. Um, you might be driven out of town um, she tells the one story about the woman that ends up pregnant in um, the women's refuge. She sent she so she's pregnant. She's sent to the city hospital, um, and this is a woman. This is actually a I think a 17 year old woman who's from the country. So this isn't an upper class woman who is having a relationship with a black man. Gets found out by her husband. Ha- kind of has to leave town. This is a a woman that is. Um, under the care of uh, the refuge, the women's refuge, an organization that's designed to kind of help um, poor white women. And um, this is on page 56. I don't know if you remember what, what specifically what um, happens in that particular story. Woman gets sent like to another hospital because, like, okay, you can't stay at this women refuge because you're having a black child. They sent her somewhere else to some like some public, I guess, a public hospital. And this is the woman that refused to um, give the name of the father um, of the child. So they couldn't they couldn't get any information from her on the subject, Um, and uh, she gets sent. Uh, somewhere else, because the women's refuge doesn't want to have a white woman who's in there, um, who's had a consensual relationship with a black man, and is with this child. Um, what are, do you do? You recall other stories that she um, tells you about white women? There was the minister's wife. Okay, there was the minister's <laughs> wife. Yeah, what does she say about the minister's wife? Well, she had a uh, <clears throat> an affair. And the, when the baby was born, they they didn't lynch the a black man. They put him in jail, and right. And then um, she finally confessed. So she accused, so she has an affair with this man. She's a minister's wife. She has an affair with this man. Yeah. She accuses then she accuses him of rape. This black man. He's put into prison. I think he spends ten years in prison actually. And he gets out, and when he gets out, she finally confesses to her husband that he didn't rape her, that this was a consensual affair. And then 
then what happens to her? Do you well, remember? He got a divorce. And yeah, he left. He divorces. They go to another. So, ta- they so to another he, he town essentially and divorces another, her. Oh, no, that so that might happen to to a white woman too. I mean, she might be forced to leave town. She might be divorced by her husband. Um, if she was an unmarried young woman, um, you know, in the case of the story of of the of the country girl, that you might wind up. Um, Kind of thrown out on the streets because it would be seen as a blemish on your reputation. There was that one well, woman, I believe she was living in the countryside and she had like a, basically like a common law marriage with a black man. And then they tried her for anti miscegenation and her defense was that she wasn't white. And so it was interesting as she tried to dispute with like her own like whiteness in, in order to be like allowed to marry this black man. Yeah, that that was a very, very interesting case, and it's something that you might um, see in the South. So here we have an instance in which a white woman's having a um, consensual relationship with a black man. They're accused of miscegenation. They go to court, and in court, she actually makes the argument that she is African American and therefore wouldn't be in violation of um, the, the miscegenation. The miscegenation laws. Well, there was something I. It sounded like from this article there were. It was almost like saying all black men they had such lust for the white woman, and this article was showing the white woman was interested in the black male too. Yes, I think that's and one. That, of that's the- what the whole article was, and I thought, wow, she's kind of throwing it back in. The faces of the white male. Yeah, it's rather provocative, right? Yeah. Well, that's what the the pamphlet was about, wasn't it? To kind of throw it back in their faces, like, hey, the white papers are lying to, you know, the general population. Yeah, I mean, one of the things she's trying to do is kind of t- deconstruct that notion that all black men are rapists, that they kind of have this bestial sexual desire to, to sort of, you know, rape white women. And she does this in a way by telling you about what's really going on with white women, what's really going on with white men, what's really going on with black women and with uh, black men. And I think, um, Pamela, you're right to suggest that what she is doing is saying that these white women, in some cases, are initiating these sexual relationships. And so what does it mean to say that white women are initiating sexual relationships at a moment in which... The the myth of the black beast rapist involves what? I mean, what is the presumption within that myth about white women? They're pure. And they're pure. They're virginal. Protection. They're uninterested in sex. They're frail. They don't. They they need protection. And what she's essentially saying is that these white women harbor sexual desire. I mean, it's a complete, a complete inversion. I mean, and that's the one I think that really, I mean, that's one of the things that really kind of aggravated a lot of people. And it's one of the statements that she made that essentially got her driven out of the South. Because she's challenging that whole construction of white womanhood, of a kind of like passive, uh, um, virtuous white woman that is in need of protection from like these hypersexualized black men. And what she's suggesting in reality is that if you look very closely, a lot of these relationships involve uh, consent, and that in some of these relationships, the white women themselves are initiating, and that therefore that is a reflection of uh, white women's interest in sex. Not something that whites other men really, really <laughs> want to want to hear or that they want to contemplate. And what she's saying about you know what she's saying about white men is that they're actually the rapists. That they're the ones that have, if you go all the way back to slavery, you'll see that these are the men that have raped black children, they've raped black women. This is something that has been a part of Southern life uh, almost forever. And that these white men produce children, and the children are mixed-race children, yet the white men never seem to be prosecuted under the anti-miscegenation laws. And she also points out that a lot of these white men are leading members of the community and that sexual, that, excuse me, that any kind of punishment that would be given out for violation of, of one of these anti-miscegenation laws 
would only involve black men and white women because that's just something they can't they cannot think of they just cannot conceptualize that but she also said that when all the men were out fighting the war there weren't any black on white rapes and so you know she's also throwing that idea that all black males are going to rape want to white rape white women why didn't they do it when the men weren't around they're off to war so i think that was a pretty provocative <clears throat> statement i hope it was factual i'm sure yeah it is and it is that is also a very very provocative yeah. <laughs> provocative statement because she's challenging so one way that she can challenge the notion that black men are somehow continually lusting after white women is to say hey look during the civil war when all these white men had gone away had left women behind um you know these are the women on the farms and the plantations that Rebecca Latimer Felton was talking about and so what Rebecca Latimer Felton was saying here you have all these women in isolation on these farms and these plantations and that they are possibly under the threat of uh rape by black men this was something Rebecca Latimer Felton thought was the case during the Civil War it's certainly something she's drawing attention to in the late 19th century but what Ida B Wells is saying is actually if you look at um the situation you can see that when all these white men went off to war there wasn't a sudden increase in in sexual assault on white women but even in gone with the wind I mean all the all the men are gone and the 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 black male remember the 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 house servant for scarlet I mean they they were honored and they took care of them and there was never any hint of anything could be happening to the Although how is it that that black male slaves are portrayed in Gone with the Wind though that is in itself also mythological as well yeah. because remember we talked about the sexual reconciliation and the kind of um images that develop in um advertising uh consumer culture film novels uh um, the, the sheet music i mean all of that yeah. i mean what was that i'm not sure gone with the wind is necessarily the best well, sort of example of that because that, in yeah. that particular um instance how how are they being portrayed they're the they're the typical house servant and they were taken care of that they were loyal yeah that they were inherently passive mm-hmm. um and they did the jing- the remember at the one party the the slaves were all outside dancing the boys were doing their their dance that you would think of the the jingle and the, but they were loyal during the war they although i'm not sure but again i'm not sure i'd be wells would necessarily want to um perpetuate the notion that they were loyal out of passivity or that they were loyal because they were a kind of quote sambo figure oh, i think what different. she's suggesting is that black men are uh not hypersexualized that they have a sense of their own manhood and masculinity that is uh, respectful of women in general whether it's black women or white women and um yes the issue of loyalty kind of overlaps with those particular um stereotypes and mythologies but i think in this particular instance She's not necessarily trying to reinforce that stereotype per se, but at least show that black men were respected individuals that they had a sense of honor and a sense of dignity in that uh you know, why is it she's saying if black men are inherently lustful? Because remember the the image of the black beast rapist is premised on the assumption that this is a like a a kind of like a biological um uncontrollable urge 
that somehow the African American race is moving backward on the evolutionary scale. I mean, we talked a little bit about the notion of、um, barbarism and the assumption that without slavery, black men have suddenly are moving backward,、um, and that that their sexual desires has have have kind of become inflamed. Yeah,、um, it was really interesting with the minister's wife. The、uh, the way she framed the story was very much like. Making the white woman seem very predatory, and that she like saw the man at like a, I believe like a gift store, like a, <laughs> something, and would like come and visit me, and he like brought a gift, and he was trying to be very polite, and she used that gift to like distract her children and then seduce him, and so it was very interesting because she phrased like framed that almost as like a complete reversal of like the black beast rapists because it was very much like a white woman. Yeah, Will,、like, you're real. That's that's a really astute observation because she's pointing out that here's this black man, I believe. He's at a store, and she, he offers to carry the packages for this white woman, and it's the white woman who kind of like makes the sexual overture toward him. So yes, I mean she's saying, look,、um, the inclination isn't necessarily for a black man to kind of sexually <laughs> assault this woman right away. That here he is behaving in a kind of very、um, gentlemanly, like kind of like. Like the the way a good Victorian man should should be, and what does she say about、um, you know black women per se? I mean, she's saying. I think you sort of hinted at this at the start of the discussion. Oh, well, I understood that. Most of the black women, you know, they they were being、um, involved with white men, but they weren't, you know, they weren't what they, they had children with white men, but it wasn't the same, you know, for them as it was for the black men. They didn't see him as a threat or something. You know, it wasn't a threat that they were involved with white men, while the black men being involved with white women was seen as a threat to the white male, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think she she wants to point out that. Um, you know, there also were were、um, you know there there also were be- common beliefs at the time that somehow black women were also maybe more prone to amorality that maybe they were sort of more、um, naturally licentious or、um, incapable of having a stable moralizing influence on black men. That somehow black women could never be respectable. That's the assumption that's kind of built into that mythology that Ida B. Wells is trying to to subvert. And so she's saying that、uh, in reality they they are、uh, the victims themselves. Did you notice in、um, Southern Horrors that there are a few times where she is writing and she'll put. A question mark in parentheses, or she'll put an exclamation point、um, in a parentheses.、Yeah. Did you see what she was trying to that she was trying to do there? So if you look on page fifty-three, and you look at the bottom of let's see here, if you go to the second paragraph up from the bottom. So the last paragraph on page fifty-three starts with Mr. Duke, and if you go to the sentence above that. But the truth、there. remains that Afro-American men do not always rape. Parentheses question mark. Close parentheses white women without their consent. Yeah. So she writes, but the truth remains that Afro-American rape. Do, excuse me. Afro-American men do not always rape white women without their consent. Rape. So she's questioning the word rape by putting it, putting the question mark in parentheses after the word rape. So quit using the word. So quit using the word, word rape is what she's suggesting, right? Rape when white women may be、uh, very happy. Yes,、yeah, a good way. <laughs> <word. laughs> um, she also does it in another instance on page sixty, where she is talking about.、Um, The problems of the South and the way in which Southern states have、uh, e- economically, politically, and socially oppressed African Americans, and she says that 
One by one, the southern states have legally disfranchised the Afro-American. And after legally, she puts that in co- in a with a question mark too. So she's questioning legally. So she's questioning the word legal. She's questioning the word rape. And it's a very subtle way of leveling a critique, right? Yeah. It seems like doing like almost like doing air quotes while talking to someone. Yeah, it's almost like doing almost like doing air quotes. It's like her saying, "Hey, I'm not dumb. I know what you're doing. <laughs> like, you know, you're not slick or anything." So, so did, um, we're we're getting kind of near the end, but I want one of the other questions that I wanted to ask you is so. Um, she does a pretty efficient job, I think, of going through and, and completely inverting that mythology and kind of trying to overturn those stereotypes and sort of give you the truth of what is actually going on. But toward the end of that particular chapter, she has um, some things to say about uh, middle-class black men. Because on the one hand, what she's saying is that some of these black men have a, a very deep Victorian sensibility, uh, a kind of politics of respectability. And we're going to be talking about this politics of respectability uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, so she talks about the man carrying the packages in the store. Um, she wants to deconstruct that nation, that, excuse me, that notion that black men are just, you know, inherently lustful and they have absolutely no, no control over their feelings. But there are, in particular towards the end, I think, that she's kind of leveling a critique at black men. In particular, she's leveling a critique at black men within her own community because she herself is deconstructing that myth, but she also has some suggestions for what black men and women need to do in the future in terms of challenging this racial and sexual... um, Exploitation. I don't know if you um, you caught this, um, and sort of toward uh, the end here. Let me see if I can find it. On the self help section. Yeah, she talks. Yeah, about, this is a se- section like, on self help. If you, if the black male or black work black people went on strike, there would be a shutdown of. You know, there wouldn't be the labor to bring in the crops and everything. Then I thought it was interesting on page 69, she talks about don't ride on the railroads. Okay, so one, so she has a couple of suggestions about what you can begin to do to kind of push back against uh, the system of Jim Crow. One is don't ride the railroads. And why don't ride the railroads? But, well, it, they'd lose money. And that, yeah, you're that taking money you out of their Rosa Parks. Yeah, you're taking money out of their pockets. The bus so, strike went, was the bus company, when the blacks didn't ride the buses after Rosa, they were, it was a financial hardship. Right, and what she's saying is that one of the ways that you can begin to kind of push and maybe erode the system is to look at the dollar, to look at it from a kind of financial perspective. And... Um, one way you can do that is um, not to ride the railroads. What else does she say you can do? Well, just leave the South. Okay, one thing you could do is just absolutely leave the South. So you take yourself away. You're not um, providing a cheap source of labor. Um, if you leave, you're going to kind of begin to undermine uh, that system. If you look in the second, at the start of the second paragraph in the self-help section on page 68, well, actually, let's walk, let's go back to the to the first paragraph. She says, in the cor- creation of this healthier public sentiment, the Afro American can do for himself what no one else can do for him. The world looks on with wonder that we have conceded so much, and remain law abiding under such great outrage and provocation. To Northern capital and Afro American labor, the South owes its rehabilitation. If labor is withdrawn, capital will not remain. The Afro-American is thus the backbone of the South. A thorough knowledge and judicious exercise of this power in lynching localities could many times effect a bloodless revolution. The white man's dollar is his god, and to stop this will be to stop outrages in many localities." 
What do you think about that? Do you think that is something that that would be successful, that it might actually uh, work? Because what she's saying is if you go to areas in which lynching is, is, is uh, kind of at its peak, uh, one way you can maybe eliminate that possibility, I guess, Will, as you were saying, is to leave, right? Because she's saying that black labor is essentially the, the backbone of, this, of the New South. The New South is built on the backs of, of black laborers. And that you can effect a bloodless revolution. And Pamela, as you're saying, we see that that is a successful strategy later in the 1950s with the Montgomery bus boycott Mm -hmm. um, as a way of kind of hurting um, the financial pockets of of whites. But I wonder what you think about, given what you've learned so far about the late 19th and early 20th Mm -hmm. century in the South, if that is something that you could see foresee as being... uh, Success, successful? I mean, it's a bloodless oh, yeah. revolution. I mean, if they leave the South, I mean, that means the uh, Southern whites, you know, white owners, you know, they're not going to have them to help them make money. Like, if they have to go sell, say, cotton at the market or something like that, they're not going to make their dollar. And it says in here that. Uh, the dollar is the white man's gold. Or God. It's his God, it's his yeah. God, yeah. God. So that's going to, it's pretty much going to put everybody in hardship, all white men in hardship. So. Uh-huh. She's advocating unionism, too. Yeah, there you go. Which is 1890s. This was printed in she's pretty, she's pretty far. That's pretty, yeah, she's pretty uh, far ahead of her time. Yeah. Will? It seems to be um, more feasible, though, for, like, city living, like, people in cities, because I think a lot of the systems that were put in place for, like, sharecropping and stuff would a lot of times prevent, uh, like, rural area black people from being able to get away from the South, be either trapped in these systems of debt, so I don't think okay. there was so much an option for them. So you're sure. saying, um, Ida B., in a way, maybe perhaps Ida B. Wells' perspective is um, a little, uh, What's the word? Um, privileged. Armor. Yeah, that maybe it's a privileged, <laughs> privileged, <laughs> privileged, or that maybe it's not realistic. That may perhaps oh, yes. it's not realistic, and that it might work in an urban setting, um, but in a rural setting, it might be awfully hard to affect a bloodless revolution if you're caught in the system of peonage and sharecropping. She was ahead of her time. What about her suggestion on uh, page seventy? Because we ha- we have just a couple minutes left, but I did want to draw attention to page seventy. Because this is where I think she really is very, very far ahead of her time. The Afro-American papers are the only ones that which will print the truth. That one, or so. If you look on page right, seventy, they should get guns. Yeah, on the second, the second yeah. full paragraph, yeah. she says. The lesson this teaches and which every Afro-American should ponder well is that a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor in every black home and it should be used for that protection which the law refuses to give. When the white man, who is always the aggressor, knows he runs as great risk of biting the dust every time his Afro-American victim does, he will have a greater respect for Afro-American life. The more the Afro-American yields and cringes and begs the more he has to do so, the more he is insulted, outraged, and lynched. So here, in a sense, she's kind of leveling a critique at a lot of her um, fellow black Southerners in suggesting that you just can't yield to this. You can't um, beg and cringe and fawn and turn your back. And I think she's probably thinking of her friends who armed themselves at the people's grocery store because they heard the mob was coming. And here she's saying, if you're going to get greater respect, you've actually got to threat, show that you're perhaps dangerous or that perhaps you can you know, act on your threat. And here she's talking about a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor. I mean, how, how more radical is that, right? I mean, what did you, what did you think of that? Dangerous having yeah. Because then, you know, it might end up turning it. You might have a. I mean, what do you think? Do you think that's a? Do you think that's? I mean, this is. What is it? This is 1892. Yeah, so she's advocating a, a kind of form of armed self-defense. Yeah, I mean, this you know is something that people assume doesn't really 
enter the, the black um, political civil rights tradition until you get maybe black power. Um, but here she's saying, look, it's time, it's time to stand up. Yeah, they're too passive. I mean, that's what yeah, in a way, she's kind of critiquing <laughs> black men and saying maybe they're a little bit too 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 passive. Well, was it hard for a black man to purchase a rifle, like a Winchester rifle? That could be a problem as well. Possibly, but what do you think the 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 outcome would be? I mean, I I know we just have like one more minute left, but I always ask students if if what you think about that particular way of. Uh, Undermining the system of Jim Crow in the South. Is it real? I mean, I think it would help a lot because I think, like, white men have this mindset, like, oh, like, they were basically unstoppable. No one was going to prosecute them or anything. So if they have the threat of possibly dying every time they try to lynch someone, they're probably going to reevaluate their odds a lot more. Uh huh. Dakota, <laughs> you get the last word in. in. I think it would need to be done in mass. Because I think if you got a few yeah. people to call themselves, but not many, you could just get those people out of the way first. You could lynch them or whatever. Uh huh. But if you did it on in mass, then See, you might actually have a problem. So it might it might be more successful if it was a kind of collective effort on the part of every single home to have a rifle and every black family to sort of put the word out that. You can't. I think it's. Can't. I think it was un, very unrealistic. You're saying in 1892, maybe it's an unrealistic for the black to have because yeah. the whites controlled the okay. guns. Okay. Well, I'll see. I'll see you guys on Wednesday, and don't forget, um, bring in the primary documents for um, the paper, and uh, we bring in the paper assignment and the book, um, Wake of Horror, and make sure you get kind of the, to the end of that, and we'll spend um, all of next session looking at the paper topic and discussing um, the book. All right, thanks.